Good afternoon and welcome to number six Convent Place for the daily COVID-19 press briefing on this, the first Sunday of April. I'm joined today by another now very familiar face, the Director of Public Health, Dr. Sohail Bhatti. Um, as we're near the end of the second week of lockdown, and on behalf of the government, I want to thank everyone who does so, the great majority of Gibraltar, for keeping to the rules. And to once again insist to those of you who don't that it's not a choice, it's an obligation backed by law, backed by common sense, backed by solidarity to the whole community, especially to the elderly. So please stay at home, and if you must go out, make sure it's for a reason provided for in law, and make sure you keep your distance from others. If you go out for exercise, you can run or walk, but please don't loiter. A walk is not a picnic. It may not be easy. It isn't easy. We all find it hard not to be able to greet our family and friends with a handshake, a hug or a kiss, but it is necessary. The virus can be kept at bay, but only by keeping to the rules. In this way, we can, each of us, save lives. Now, this is important. The weather will turn for the better soon, and Easter weekend is coming. Traditionally, that is the start of when we start going to the beach. Well, sadly, not this year. The beaches have not been closed as such, but going to the beach in the way that we do in Gibraltar is not allowed. You can walk along the beach, even go down for a quick swim if that is your preferred form of exercise, always keeping your distance. But going to the beach and spending time there is not allowed under the regulations. It would inevitably lead to close contact between households, including children, doing what comes naturally to them and playing with each other. This is just the opportunity that the coronavirus is waiting for to spread and infect many more people. This year's resfriado de verano would be a deadly one. We must not allow this. This must not be abused. If we find that it is being abused, we may be forced to close the beaches altogether. We don't want to do this, and it would be unfair on those who keep the rules. But we will if we have to. We must keep ahead of the virus, and we must save lives. Many people have been thanked many times in these briefings, and I echo all those thanks, the GHA, ERS, Emergency and Support Services, teachers, the MOD, volunteers. I want to thank also those others who are still at work, including those working from home, as well as those attending their usual workplace, including my staff throughout my ministry in environment, heritage, culture, and of course, public health, for keeping Gibraltar going those in offices, public buildings, in restaurants doing the delivery work and the delivery services, even those in shops who provide delivery services too, so we can provide and procure items that we need in order to keep some semblance of normality in our new day-to-day -day lives. And always in the background to the wider public service. The Chief Secretary and his team, including human resources, who have been working so hard in deploying and redeploying staff to heads of departments and their teams. In my own area, all those at Environment, including the Department of Environment and Climate Change and the Environmental Agency, as well as horticultural, cleaning and other contractors. They have all been continuing with their own important work, including looking after our planted areas, looking after our macaques, controlling the gulls, refuse collection, street cleaning and the patrolling of BGTW with the department also liaising with supermarkets and wholesalers, ensuring that we have the supplies we need, and also dealing with the unpleasant task of ensuring that we have capacity for burials. To all of them, to the whole community, renewed and continuing thanks. It's important, I think, to keep reminding ourselves of our state of readiness. I visited the Nightingale facility at Europa a few days ago, and was amazed at the progress to absolute readiness that had been made there since my earlier visit just over a week before. It was impressive, 
and the energy I could see in the place, including the training that was going on, was inspiring. At the same time, it was scary. I really don't want to see it put to any use at all, but it brings home the fact that we are in danger still. But we are ready. As Dr. Rawal said yesterday, we have an incredible number of beds available, 132 at St. Bernard's, 190 at Nightingale Ward, and 16 at elderly residential sites, making a total of 338 completely unprecedented in Gibraltar. And as of today, we have, as Dr. Rawal said again yesterday, 55 ventilators as well as other devices to supply oxygen. Our visiting expert, Professor Ian Cumming, told me just a couple of days ago that in his view we are far better prepared in Gibraltar than they were in the UK. That is a result of the detailed planning and hard work of many, indeed of the whole community. Now it's time to share the information of what's happening down at St Bernard's at A&E. In the 24 hours to 8.30 this morning, there had been 39 attendances in total at A&E. Of these, four had COVID symptoms. Three of those who attended were during the day and one in the night. All were swabbed, two were admitted. And now for the COVID test results. The first lot of results exclude the random sampling of 400. So these are the standard ones we have been taking, responding to people presenting with symptoms. A total of 1,001 swabs have been taken. There are 202 results pending. Confirmed cases, 102. Active cases, 50. Recovered cases, 52. In addition, of the 400 random, 344 have now been taken. There are 230 pending. Uh, 114 has been received, of which one was positive. We've therefore now taken a total of 1,345 swabs, and I believe per capita we are about the third highest in the world. As you know, there are scientific and statistical experts analysing the data that are emerging. My colleague Gilbert Likudi gave more information about this yesterday. Having looked at the latest information, a few trends appear to be emerging. One is the fact that the number of persons who have recovered has at least for now, today, overtaken the number of people still with an active infection. As more results come in, this could change, but that's the situation today. Significantly, perhaps, the rate of increase in the positives detected seems to be dropping, a drop which seemed to coincide and begin around the time of lockdown. This is what we mean when we say we want to flatten the curve. But it's too early to confirm this, and as I say every time, this is not a trigger for complacency, quite the contrary. If the trend is true, it is proof that we must take the measures we are taking and that we must stay at home. If something is working, that is the main reason to keep it going. Perhaps it's somewhat similar to, say, starting a course of antibiotics. They start to work, you start feeling better, then you don't finish the course and the infection comes back with a vengeance. We must finish this course. So if the strategy is working, that is the main reason for keeping at it. The virus lurks. It is lurking. It is there, awaiting its opportunity to infect, to hurt and to kill. We will still have more cases and we will still have deaths. We cannot escape that reality. And on that rather somber note, again, um, I hand over to Dr. Bati. Afternoon, everyone. Um, I wanted, uh, always wonder what to say um, during this time to speak to you, you um, all those people that are locked up um, in their own homes, um, po possibly squabbling, playing their games, watching TV. Um, and these are indeed tough times. But I do remember that as we are in a war, uh, that in a previous war people had to face um, bombing, they had to face um, completely random death coming at them from in the way of um, uh, shells and, and other things. So I think in that sense, I remember the generation of the evacuation. I think actually we are really 
um, fortunate that we don't have to face those tribulations, but this is a war. Um, I thought it might be worthwhile just talking a little bit about masks. Um, there's an awful lot of pressure on people um, wanting masks, uh, and there are various reports coming in from various countries. Um, I'm a little bit disappointed that people are um, folding to the pressure. I think a lot of this is public pressure. There always was a little bit of evidence to suggest that wearing a mask uh, would certainly protect you from passing it on to someone else. And on that basis, we've taken a risk-based approach, um, particularly in Mount Alvernia, to enable people who are coming in from outside to ensure that our elderly senior citizens are protected as much as possible. But increasingly, people are wearing masks, I think, in some sense, trying to think they might protect themselves. And as I've said repeatedly, um, once your mask becomes saturated with moisture, it doesn't start. It doesn't work as a uh, as a filter in any way. Um, in fact, research has been published just uh, last week that indicated that the virus can survive on a surgical mask for up to nine days. Um, interestingly enough, it can survive on less for less than three hours on newspaper. So there's an awful lot of people who are concerned about touching railings or t uh, or getting shopping in. Generally, if um, you just leave it for a few hours, up to six hours, you should be okay. Obviously, the advice is use um, mild bleach or detergent, and you should be safe from that. Um, so coming back to the pressure on masks, um, I take the view that, um, as, as they have taken in England, that actually it's about managing risk. And one of the things that we all worry about is risk and the issue, sadly, with risk is we have sometimes a misperception of what risk is. Um, all of us get into transport, um, but something that perhaps other people, or most people may not appreciate, that your lifetime risk, if you're a 75-year-old person, is 1 in 256 of actually dying in a motor vehicle. That never stops us from getting into a motor vehicle. Uh, we sit quite comfortably in planes. We smoke cigarettes. And in many ways, I see um, people wearing masks as a sign, perhaps, of their own insecurity. Um, we are trying, uh, and I've been very consistent about this, uh, we're trying to slow the spread of the virus. We're not trying to stop the virus. We cannot stop the virus. There is no mechanism. And the longer uh, we drag this out, flatten the curve, the bigger the chance there is of us coming up with a test that will be able to define who is immune and who isn't. Um, we may, in fact, develop antivirals that may help as well. Um, this is all why we're asking you to protect your grandma and your grandpa. You're staying indoors in order to protect them. Um, I'm pleased to announce that we've managed to get hold of a new assay, a new kind of test um, that uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Nick Cortez, has managed to procure for us, uh, which I think is being featured uh, today in the news um, this is the same test as we currently carry out, but the process doesn't take 8 to 12 hours. It takes 5 minutes. So this will make a dramatic difference in the way that we test. But remember, this test only tells you if you are carrying an, infec an infection and are infectious now. So it only works for a small window. There's no point in seeking a test to see if you've had it because invariably the test will be negative. And I think we're waiting for an antibody pet test, a reliable antibody test that will tell us that. Um, and even if we were able to suppress the virus here, um, the analogy I use is we'll be a dry bush um, sitting right next to two forest fires that are burning away, the raging one in Spain and a slightly less raging one in London. Um, so the issue for us is even if we suppress it, though it will take a spark to come across. Um, so I, I just want to also end on perhaps a sombre note, which is um, we all fear the thing that um, is always haunts us throughout our whole lives. Our children come to terms with it uh, fairly early on, and that is our own demise, our, our own death. And I've said this before, that actually we should um, make our peace. Um, those of us with faith uh, recognize that we have an allotted time um, and at that time, we will move on. 
other people have a slightly different view about what that time is. However, there is no one I know who is immortal, and at least not that they've declared. Um, and it means that actually one of the great things about this virus is it forces us to um, address our own mortality and actually start to have some honest conversations, both with ourselves, amongst ourselves, our children, and most importantly, with our parents. Um, I wish... I wish there was one way that I could save a single life above and beyond what we've done. It haunts me that, I, that I'm not able to. I don't have a magic bullet that people will die in this particular um, epidemic. I wish that wasn't true, but it will come and it will create grief. And therefore, I'm asking you all to make your peace with people that you love. Have those conversations. We don't know when and how it will strike. Um, we mustn't have a sense of complacency about this virus. So even if we do suppress it locally, it could come in two or three waves. Um, we have done everything possible. We've increased our bed capacity. Um, and I was just looking, it's something like 16,500 16, beds per million. Um, I've looked at the number of tests we've carried out. There was an awful lot of concern earlier on. We're now at 37,000 tests per million. Um, and I think we've done a huge amount of work to try to identify and address this particular issue. Um, I don't want to fill your minds with all sorts of figures. So as a parting thought, um, be kind to each other, love each other, show affection for each other. Um, and let's all get through this together um, with the courage and the heroism that I've seen all around me through this very difficult time. Thank you. Thank you, Sahil. <clears throat> so uh, we now move over to questions from the press. Good afternoon. The first question is from the Olive Press for Minister Cortes. How will sick leave be affected in the public service if people are self-isolating because of symptoms for a time and then have to get back on sick leave when those symptoms reoccur shortly after? Will this eat into their holiday pay, holiday pay or will they be given special exclusions considering the needs not to spread the virus? Well, this is one of the matters that the Chief Secretary as head of the civil service will be addressing. Uh, these are... Uh, very unique times. They are, uh, we are presented with a situation where we haven't been presented before, uh, when people in some occasions are um, being asked not to, to go to work because they have to isolate. Um, we are obviously uh, dealing uh, with, uh, as I say, an unusual situation which will be addressed not just in Gibraltar, but this is a problem that... Uh, uh, the public service and, and, in fact, even private employers will have to consider how they are going to react. I think that the way that the government has responded um, in offering support to businesses and so on shows that the government's intention is to help people. Uh, and people need not be concerned uh, or worried unduly, provided they don't abuse it, because even in, those, in these times, we are... Uh, obviously faced with people who may want to abuse uh, and take it as an opportunity not to work. But I have every confidence in the Chief Secretary, in Darren and his team to address this and to come up with the, the outcome that, that the civil service deserves because of the hard work they are doing. If I may, Minister, the new rapid test that I've just talked about, uh, the lamp assay, uh, we're buying tens of thousands of them. Uh, we've actually got the machines in Gibraltar now. We're just waiting for the final assay to arrive, I hope, in a week or so. And, with, and we bought huge numbers of them. So I would assume that it will be possible um, for us to test people who are reporting symptoms to be able to establish whether they actually have the condition or not. I'm sure that's going to radically change um, the way that people approach this. Remember that when we started the process of health, self-isolation and so on, it was a much newer disease even than it is now, mm -hmm. and things have moved forward. So the situation will probably um, not be um, as uh, confusing, for want of a better word, than perhaps it was at the beginning when all this was so new. 
Next question for Dr. Bhatti from YGTV. Apart from the 57-year-old man who passed away on Thursday, has the GHA tested any other people who have passed away in the last month for COVID-19? If not, is it, is, some, is it something that the GHA plans to do with all future deaths, or will this only be done in cases where the person has experienced COVID symptoms? So we have tested other people. Um, initially, I think we were doing that in a slightly ad hoc approach, uh, but the law has changed um, it changed on Friday, and um, as uh, death certification rules now are under the emergency, everyone that dies will have a swab taken so that we can be sure that someone who has died hasn't died with COVID. Of course, there's a difference between dying with the disease and dying of the disease. If you die of the disease, you almost invariably have pneumonia and you have problems breathing. If you die with the disease, you may die of another condition, but you may have just coincidentally at that time either have the, the virus or, in fact, the virus may have just been enough to tip your, um, your life over into um, the, the, that scenario. So we're going to be doing that every, for every death from now on. And we've actually streamlined the death uh, process so that uh, relatives can get hold of the bodies and we can get an accurate um, cause of death as rapidly as possible. We've introduced a new system of CT scanning. It's called a digital post-mortem. Um, so what will happen is bodies will be um, put into a body bag. I'm sorry to talk about this, but that's life, if, if I can put it that way. So if people, the deceased will be uh, put into a body bag to ensure that there's no infective risk anywhere. The body will be transported, well, the swabs will be taken um, when the body is transported to a mortuary um, and then they will be put, passed through a CT scan when, clearly, when there is space and time in the CT scanner, because obviously the living take priority at that time. Uh, but it will mean that we'll have a far more accurate uh, information on the cause of death, as well as information about whether COVID was uh, linked to that death too. And another question for Dr. Bhatti from the Panorama. Can you clear the ongoing confusion as to the availability of swabs? Minister Varavan last week in a press briefing explicitly stated swabs are being received almost daily and there was a good stock. Contrary to that, Dr. Rawal said yesterday there was not enough swabs to locally conduct extensive testing and that Gibraltar was competing to obtain swabs. Can you clear this ambiguity and explain what really is the situation regarding the availability of swabs? If I may say, I think what Dr. Rawal said yesterday, that we didn't have enough swabs to test the whole of the population. That's 30,000 swabs, but uh, mm. yeah. here we'll have them. Yes, um, so we are having a constant supply of swabs coming in. Um, they're not the ideal version of the swab we would like, but so we're using dry swabs, swabs that don't have a bit of solution. Nor the normal swabs they're using in the UK, for example, have a bit of fluid at the bottom to keep it moist and actually to act as an antibacterial agent. Uh, but we've been told that we can use uh, effectively what look like very long cotton buds um, and use them as a 